Okay, given that um, we've, we're, we're going to be short on time, I think, this morning, and I know that some of you already made um, reservations for taxis at noon, so let's, let's get started. Um, Mike just passed around uh, a list, and you may have seen his email. Let's go over the uh, work plan, make sure that uh, we didn't miss anything. I'm going to revise the, the outline for our report. I will get that to you uh, shortly after I return. Um, on early September, Versar is going to get the exposure estimates for women of childbearing age to, to Chris. Uh, and Bern and I will get the Noels to Chris so she can factor those into her hazard index analysis. And uh, September 20th, we're going to have a conference call, 11.30 a.m. to 1 p.m. Eastern Time. Revised report sections will be due October 20th. We'll have our next meeting November 2nd, 3rd, and 4th. And Mike will invite Kim Bokelhyde, Richard Sharp, Earl Gray, and Paul Foster to speak to us. At that next meeting, we will discuss exposure, exposure scenarios and biomonitoring approaches. So the, the focus will really be on that next meeting. And we will also discuss updates of other sections, which I don't expect will take much time in that meeting. Yeah. That's right, they said they could do it in three weeks. I think it, it won't take, a, once they get the first one, the next one won't take long, but I, you know, I'm, not sure exactly how long. Sometime in September, maybe. For? Or the, the, the infants. One? Yeah. Okay. But, but, so we could move to late August, say the third week of August. Yeah. The uh, women of childbearing age, and then have the infants in early September? Or mid-September, maybe. But at least it, I, the four-hour Conference, sure. Conference I mean, if it comes in two days before, I'm not going to. Yeah. But we'll have enough to talk. Yeah. It's oh. sort of like, you know. I'm sorry. It puts some pressure on that. This oh, yes, I agree. I agree. If that's what you want to do, totally agree with you. Would you revise that, Mike? Yeah. Remember, in November, I won't be here on the 2nd. I'll be just barely coming back from Europe. Any other uh, additions or corrections? Okay, then on uh, November 12th, we have another conference call, 11.30 a.m. to 1 p.m. Eastern Time. And there we're going to begin talking about recommendations. We'll have a meeting January 19th and 20th, at which time we're going to begin to put together the final draft, or the, put together a draft report. And parking lot issues, uh, interspecies differences with respect to phthalate syndrome. don't have anyone assigned to that. That's something. I can't remember. I mean, I've got 
some of that in my section. That's something you mentioned, Andreas, right? That we needed to. I, uh, yes, I mentioned it, but I can't claim to be exactly expert on, on but this. But I refresh my memories in terms of what you were asking beyond what I've already written in my section. Was that the metabolism? No, it's, it's to do with new findings about how the Lydic cell in the developing testis is set up to do what it does. And in relation to that, whether there is reduction of fetal androgen synthesis in the rat or the human or any other species. I mean, we don't, do we have to assign anyone to it at this point? Part of the reason why we're inviting the speakers, remember, so after their presentation. I'm not. I'm not sure because I, I don't recall the specifics of what we were looking for in that interspecies differences. So, well, I think that was part of the reason why we invited want to invite some of them back. Okay. All right. We'll just leave that as as other anti antigens. New section by Andreas. Uh, testicular dystenesis syndrome, add discussion to epidemiology section, and back up updated literature searches, and, and that's something Mike will do, correct? Okay. Anything else in our parking lot? Mike, or uh, Byrne? Uh, something that would save us time <clears throat> later if we can have agreement on it now, and we've talked about it a couple of times, reaching agreement not only on the location of references throughout the document, but the style of references, because we're going to be adding more and more of those in the next couple of months, and it would be nice to know now what the accepted style for everybody is going to be. I think that was one of my assignments, was to propose a, a style or maybe some choices, but... We can just label tables and figures within chapters. I think for starters, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And just and set them inside the text, not at the end and things um, like that. You know, again, that can be done at the end. It's some, I, I mean, I find it easier to do the editing first and then take care of that. Anything else? Okay, then uh, I think we'll move on to, uh, we had some discussions left uh, to address in terms of uh, uh, the document. I think we were, Russ was going to discuss his section. I think Mike was going to talk a little bit about his, and Chris and, and Poja were going to discuss theirs. So we've got those to uh, do this morning. Um, Mike, I think I'll, I'll go to you first in case you have to uh, deal with the uh, council. Later. Okay, well, uh, in tab three, uh, I talked about this a little bit yesterday. Um, we have uh, actually now nine of ten toxicity toxicity reviews completed by Versar. So you've got a total, uh, well, I just emailed one, uh, I think Friday. Um, so the only one left is diethyl. Um, the exposure assessment work is underway. Um, we did send an updated literature search, but that's something that we can do periodically we, that was sent after the last meeting. Um, uh, skipping down, um, in I have a introductory section that just talks about the, the history, the CPSIA and all that stuff. And then uh, we can add to that uh, something about phthalate chemistry and physical 
chemical properties, the kind of background stuff that normally goes at the beginning. Um, some information about uses and worldwide production. Um, we do also have someone who is uh, reviewing uh, some reports. There, there are reports in the literature claiming that phthalates are naturally occurring or can be naturally occurring. Um, and there's uh, actually uh, maybe a couple dozen papers but of varying quality. Some of them are not very good and not very convincing. Uh, some of them are a little bit better. So we have someone reviewing them just with the goal of is there credible, credible evidence that they can be produced naturally. The problem, I mean, even if it's true, there's no way to assess how this might contribute to the, our total exposure. You know, does it get into food? A lot of these are from, claimed to be isolated from medicinal herbs and that sort of thing. Uh, some from microbes. So we just want to get a sense of, of what's possible or is it plausible that this can happen and then, you know, give it to the chap and you can do with it. Uh, handle it however however you want it's just uh, um, for the sake of completeness and we let's see we are trying to I am trying to put together some tables to, you know now that we have tax reviews on I don't know 40 compounds or something uh, try to sum up that information to make it a little bit easy, more usable by the chap. And, you know, we've had some discussions um, about some industry studies. In fact, they gave us a handout yesterday mm -hmm. that there are some studies, um, new studies that they've done on DINP that they hope to have available by the end of September. I think their plan is to submit them for publication, and then at that point they would make the actual studies available, the manuscripts available to the chap. Um, and because we had talked about, you know, end of September as a uh, a date after which we would not be obligated to review every new paper that comes out. So that's about that around that time. Um, as far as the introduction section, that's in tab four, or actually tab five. And what I did since the last version, what I added was at the very end, I added some, uh, a series of questions uh, that to try and lay out the sort of the intermediate steps that you could might that would hopefully lead you to the final recommendations and you know you can these aren't really they, they don't need to be in the in the introduction they're just uh, just to, to help the thought process they probably should be a separate just a uh, note to the to the panel and you know Again, this is to try to make your job a little bit easier, and you can do with this. You could ignore this or change it in any way you want. And then also yesterday, uh, the, the tables in the back just show, you know, a list of all the phthalates. I highlighted the ones that the chap is interested in. We'll add in some uh, physical chemical properties, uh, use information. There's a little bit of production information here to get a, a sense of, you know, what the main ones are, which ones are high production volume, um, and even 
there are some trends as to which ones are increasing and which ones are decreasing. So we'll take the information in these tables and to try to fold it into a uh, into the background section. Um, Very handy. Yeah, I think they're excellent. Yeah, and this is, you know, it, it, it's all background information and it's all for the authors, the, you know, I, you and Byrne want to rewrite it, do whatever you want. It's just a compiled all this information. Uh, it's up to you, up to the the authors and the, the panel uh, to, you know, take or leave what you want. Uh, but the information's there. One question I have is how will we reference the, um, the tox reports? Uh, I think we'll reference well, I mean, in terms of the style, we'll, we'll come up with something, but there are, um, I guess, like you would cite any government report. Um, and because these are, well, actually, at the mom moment, um, there, some of these haven't been cleared yet. Clear, they're not all cleared yet, so they're not all on the website, but eventually they will be. So you can cite them or. So they, but by the time our report comes out, they will all be available. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Or you can treat them as background documents and, you know, it, the, the purpose of them is basically to just get the information for you to use because you and Byrne have written you know, these talk sections. Mm -hmm. So you could just use it as a, almost like an, an annotated literature search. Older? Um, Mike and Phil, as, as we are all writing on our final drafts of each, each section, you pointed out the, 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 the literature deadline. Shouldn't we fix a literature deadline for to what publications we accept? Well, I think... Did, did we fix yeah. it? Did we fix the literature oh, deadline? I thought we did. September, um, but we could revise it. Yeah. Well, I think it was end of September, and I, I thought it was kind of a soft, you know, not a hard deadline. And, but and Especially if there was a important paper that came out after the deadline, we would try to include it. But that, that was our discussion, I guess, at the March meeting, as I remember. Yeah. But I would, I mean, we can do that, but I think for clarity and in the interest of transparency, we, we should agree on a census date. We can always make exceptions, mm -hmm. but we could, I think it's quite important to fix that now. Otherwise, we um, block ourselves, my fear. Okay. And if, if there's a really a bombastic paper appearing after that census deadline, then we can always take it into account. But I think, well, I think for clarity, yeah. we should agree it. Agree on a date and then stick to it. And if there's yeah. anything that's a blockbuster, we put it in. And we say in the introduction or put in, in you know, up front, say this is based upon the evidence that was presented to us and used in the evaluation through, uh, published through XYZ. And that's where you end it. And I think it's our intent to to basically have our sections completed when we meet at the November meeting. Mm -hmm. So I think it's reasonable to say, um, and we're going to have a revised reports uh, sections by October 20th. So I think it's reasonable to say that at the end of September that that's that's the cutoff point in terms of papers that we're going to review and include in our yeah. updates. Great. Think about it this way, the same holds true for the exposure assessment that Versa is doing. I mean, you know, 
data can trickle in from now until the end, and I think we just have to stop, mm -hmm. or else it's, it's just not going to be very valuable, making a permanent contribution to what we're going to do. Yeah. Mike, would you capture that in the, in the minutes sure. so that we have that officially documented? Sure. The 30th of September, 2011, yeah. Yep. Any other questions for Mike? Um, I know, I just want to add that we're, you know, we're just trying to pull the information together in a useful form mm -hmm. for the chap to use. I mean, right. We're not trying to write any part of the report. Yeah, and that's that's the information that, that Bern and I will pull together in, in the introduction. <clears throat> okay. Russ, do you want to go through your section, please? Okay, so the, um, the epidemiology section, this is, I think, the third version. And you probably just saw version two last time. But I, I can go through it broadly, mm -hmm. and then we can, if there are questions. And I had a few questions, too, in terms of um, the level of detail and the focus. Um, so basically, I, I, I start off describing how I wanted to um, focus more so, not completely restrict to epidemiologic studies investigating health outcomes in relation to gestational or infant childhood exposure because that's consistent with the charge of the CHAP. And then what I've done is I divided the um, uh, epidemiologic section into uh, smaller sections based on the health outcomes. So the first one is uh, phthalates and reproductive tract and genital development. And so in this, I included a fairly detailed description of the Swan studies and the uh, Huang study uh, as well. And I've started, as <clears throat> we discussed at the last meeting, to put the data into tables. So some of the tables are more complete, others um, are not. but. Um, I'd appreciate any suggestions. I mean, they're, they're kind of standard tables in terms of column headings that you'll see in an epidemiologic review where uh, author the study design, which of course is important in judging the quality of the study, um, the outcomes, exposure measures, so the matrices that were used, another column for results, and then generally there's a column for comments. So this is um, you know, fairly fairly standard. I could add column or reduce it. I, I think the, the bare minimum is there, though. I mean, I wouldn't want to take anything, any of the columns out. So that, that's the first section on the anogenital distance and genital development. Um, it's probably around five or six pages, so I went into um, a bit of detail here as compared to the other sections because it's it's so relevant to the phthalate syndrome. Um, and then I also try to describe or, or discuss after describing the studies, uh, interpreting and synthesizing across. And in this case, there's only you know three or four studies on this endpoint, but trying to describe some of the potential limitations um, and then also put it in the context of the phthalate syndrome, which I, I mentioned um, relatively briefly with the understanding that that's going to be discussed or is discussed in the toxicology uh, section. And the, the pages don't have, have numbers on it, but it's um, the page right before the occupational exposure in male reproductive tract anomalies. And <clears throat> what I've done here is after describing the results of these studies, I raised a few questions, including um, the, not so much the clinical significance, or the interpretation of a reduced anogenital distance in humans. And there was a few recent 
recently published studies in which they looked at associations between AGD and other reproductive uh, health outcomes. She reported associations with hypospadias. Um, Mendiola looked at AGD and um, poor semen quality uh, <clears throat> in men, as did Eisenberg. So I thought these studies, even though they haven't looked at phthalates specifically, helps put in perspective what the interpretation may be of a shortened AGD in humans and also brings in the endpoints that are relevant or part of the phthalate syndrome, hypospadias and um, well-reduced semen quality um, could also be considered part of that in terms of looking at adult animals following developmental uh, exposure. And then um, I briefly say, and I'm going to expand upon this based on yesterday's discussion, that these human studies demonstrate shortened AGD is associated with conditions that comprise the phthalate syndrome, support the use of AGD as a relevant measure to assess the anti-androgenic mode of action of phthalates during fetal development. Um, so I then um, go on to mention the testicular dysgenesis syndrome. I don't describe it. I can then describe it probably in a few sentences. I, I don't think it needs more. Um, and in thinking about this further, um, the testicular dysgenesis syndrome hypothesis is, is a hypothesis, basically trying to link observations in humans of reduced semen quality, uh, well, geographic differences, but potentially temporal differences, changes over time, increased rates of testicular germ cell cancer, and um, some data suggesting that some of the male reproductive tract anomalies may have increased over time. So it was a hypothesis trying to link these observations to uh, exposure during fetal life to the testis, leading to these manifestations either at birth or, or later in life. So I, I view that as, in a way, different than specifically the phthalate syndrome, which basically um, is observed in rats following gestational exposure, and there's um, specific manifestations that are included in the syndrome. And in thinking about it more, I, I almost think of the testicular dysgenesis syndrome hypothesis as a broader description of an insult. And it, it could be exposure. It could be they also include like IUGR, intrauterine growth retardation, as leading to testicular dysgenesis and these manifestations. And then the phthalate syndrome and I'd like to get your thoughts on this, could potentially be thought of in a way as a subset or a specific example of the TDS hypothesis, because I'm sure there are other examples that, that you can think of that would fit under the broad umbrella of testicular dysgenesis syndrome. So what I'm trying to say is, is I don't equate the two as equivalent. I think the TDS hypothesis is, is much broader, and the phthalate syndrome is more potentially an example of testicular dysgenesis syndrome in relation to phthalates. Important difference, though, is you don't see increase or you don't see in rats testicular uh, germ cell cancer, which you do in humans, and that was a large part of the testicular dysgenesis syndrome hypothesis, the thinking behind it. Um, so they, they differ in that regard. But I see it m potentially more as describing the testicular dysgenesis syndrome hypothesis and then that the phthalate syndrome potentially is an example of this in rats. And then the next step could potentially be what I've done when I try to put in perspective the AGD results from the SWAN study associations and other studies between AGD and hypospadias, semen quality, et cetera, as potentially providing a link between what we see in humans with the phthalate syndrome in rats. So really making those distinctions. TDS really is, and phthalate syndrome are really not the same, that one is in a way a subset of the other and then trying to link the human data together. So I'd welcome thoughts on 
on the left. Do you think you, that you can distill this out in some kind of table? Because I read a lot about this, the comparison between TDS and phthalate syndrome. Do you think it, it, it is manageable to, to put all this in a table and compare it? In the NAS report, but didn't we just have a diagram that kind of helped, kind of a Venn diagram that yeah. sort of? Yeah. Yeah, so I could modify that. Um, I haven't looked at that recently, so it, it may require some changes or, or the way I'm thinking about it potentially here, um, but, but definitely yes. So, so visually, either a table or, or, a, or a figure. Especially as it has been a topic then, and obviously some modifications might have come in, it would be valuable to have this in, in our draft. So, Chris, with respect to the NAS report, what modifications would you see between what you all concluded and what Russ is discussing now? It's pretty much consistent. That's, yeah, I mean, I think, I don't think there's, I mean, you've updated the, that work. I think that that was very good work then. It's still good work. But, yeah, I don't, is it a different, are you saying something different than what was in no, the I, I don't think so. I, you know, I just haven't looked at it in a few months, so I, but I don't think I am. I think it's consistent with what so we... So that should be stated somewhere clearly that there's a consistency between, yeah. and maybe that's where the Venn diagram comes in. You say, because that's from that report, and then you say consistent with the previous approach, the data doesn't lead to a, a, a divergence from that conclusion. Brings in the, the uh, Venn diagram rather quickly. Yeah, but I think what I want to be careful about is because, as Holger mentioned, there's, uh, I think, a few papers that have come out um, talking about, well, there is no data supporting the Tissicodrysgenesis syndrome hypothesis in data in humans, is um, be careful not to put an equal sign between the two because then if, you know, someone basically points to either, some of these I think were editorials mostly or commentaries, that, um, you know, there's, there's no data in humans showing early life exposure to any chemical really or gestational exposure in testicular dysgenesis syndrome. And partly that's because it's nearly impossible to, to do such a study with a, such a rare cancer, that that would then invalidate that equal sign, you know, basically if, if the testicular dysgenesis syndrome hypothesis is lacking data and support, it doesn't translate to mean that the phthalate syndrome doesn't exist. So I, I wouldn't want to too strongly equate them, but I think with a Venn diagram and showing the, the overlap and then explaining succinctly in probably a few sentences what I, what I just said puts it, I think, in better, better perspective and really does separate the two. I, I think you're a very clear writer, so I liked what you wrote. I, um, my, one question I have when I read this, uh, it seemed like I saw someone speak once talking about how common some of these abnormalities are. Um, do you have any, have you read that? Uh, if I remember right, uh, this The birth this defects? Person said, yeah, said like 3% of all male births have mm -hmm. some kind of reproductive tract mm -hmm. anomaly. Not that it's necessarily due to phthalates. But right. just how common is well, that? Well, for creep orchidism, und undescended testes, there's data suggesting at birth it, it could be 3% or higher. Uh, a large percentage will resolve during the first year of life, but uh, uh, it's, it's generally considered um, to have a prevalence of about 1% creep orchidism. Hypospadias is, is less so, but of um, birth defects, hypospadias and creep orchidism are the, the pretty much the most common that you'll see as you compare it to cardiovascular or, you know, other birth defects that are much, much rarer. So that, I think that might be a nice addition just to sort of place it in context. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure people walking around know that. It's not something my, from my normal life that I, you know, I've ever run against. It's only scientists that kind of know that. 
Yeah, I mean, the, but the data in relation to phthalates is on AGD, and then the link with hypospadias is a separate study between AGD and hypospadias. I mean, I could definitely put in a line in terms of what the prevalence of these conditions are, but there's, there's not a study on phthalates and hypospadias or cryptorchins, so it's a, it's kind of, you know, an A to B, if A and B and then are equal, then, you know, and B and C, then potentially A and C are, are related. But I think it's an important, here's why, you know, the, the whole discussion about, it gets back to the um, evaluation of chemical mixtures. Um, and so people have been talking, you know, let's group chemicals based on adverse outcome. And it might be that some motivation of knowing, oh, there are these, you know, incidences of such high uh, alarming rates, um, maybe that is a reason to start thinking about what, what is it that could be related to that and uh, group chemicals that broadly, not something. Well, the data on, um, I think when you said alarming rates is you, you may really have meant increase increasing rates over time of, of these conditions and then there's the hypothesis that they may be related to environmental chemicals, right? Mm. Um, nothing really on phthalates, there's data on some other chemicals, even the data looking at the trends or over time are difficult sometimes to interpret in terms of the diagnosis of these mm -hmm. conditions. Is it surveillance data? Is it data from you know, hospital setting, what's the degree of hypospadias that's recorded because, you know, some may have not recorded the, the minor mm -hmm. versus severe and if you then change criteria over 30 years, what's reported. Um, so there's even, I think, not complete agreement or definitely not agreement in terms of whether there are increases over time. There's definitely geographical differences. Mm. And whether that's partially genetic and or environmental, um, there's some some data, but but not a lot. But I can I can try to. I think you had mentioned that last time. I remember. Now you mentioned Sorry about yeah. Record. What? Sorry to be a broken record. <laughs> no, no. But I I can definitely uh, add something in. So. Um, so I can incorporate that um, into the report in a more of a discussion of TDS, but I, I don't want to go off, I don't want to go too deeply down that path because it's relevant but separate in a way from, from what, we're, what we're doing. Um, and then I brought in, in the next section is occupational exposure and male reproductive tract anomalies. And some of these studies were mentioned at the last meeting. I think Andreas has, had mentioned the Ormond study. Um, I, you know, I, I found a few others. So uh, I included these in which they looked at occupational exposure to phthalate with cryporchidism, hypospadias, um, and described these studies. But noting a limitation that they didn't have specific measures of phthalates, in these occupational settings, usually using usually interviews or job exposure matrices, they tried to get at phthalate exposure. Of course, there's other co-exposures um, as well in, in some of these settings, and this is um, the Danish National Birth Cohort, uh, one in um, England by um, Ormond. So I, th I thought I put this in, it's about a page as more um, kind of supporting information and to make the, um, the literature review on, on phthalates and these endpoints more complete and then also being um, objective in terms of the study design limitations, which is right uh, in that last paragraph. Um, then I moved on to the second section, which is actually an endpoint that's growing in terms of the literature the amount of literature on neurodevelopmental outcomes and phthalates. I think um, there was a paper actually that's not included in here that just came out online in environmental health perspectives that I'll have to include, but there's I, I think about four or five now uh, papers that have looked at neurodevelopmental outcomes. I discussed them in, in a fair amount of detail. There's uh, two from Mount Sinai School of Medicine, Angle, um, actually three, Angle, Angle, and Miodovnik and um, the Swan 
study. Uh, des describe these um, in a fair amount of detail, started to put them uh, into uh, a table. And these were um, basically pregnancy cohorts in which they assessed gestational exposure and then looked at these outcomes in the children um, young, when, they were, when they were young. Um, there's also one cross-sectional study from Korea, which I put less weight on because, as we know, a urinary phthalate measure is reflecting exposure in the past 12 hours, 24 hours at, at most. And if you're looking at an outcome like um, IQ, et cetera, it, it's hard to, to know how relevant that exposure measure is at the same time that you're measuring your outcome in, in terms of the relevant exposure window. <clears throat> which could be years earlier or even uh, prenatal, but um, wanting to be complete again and then included a second Korean study by, by Kim looking at ADHD, ADHD symptoms um, as well. And I, the table is very incomplete, I think partially because at our last meeting I mostly had this section written and now I have to go back to the papers and pull the information from it. I'm going to try to keep the table um, fairly simple, especially in outcome, because as we know, there's some of these studies can have a dozen or more different neuropsych or developmental tests, and to start listing every single one in the association with every single one, I think, would make it a difficult read. Um, so I wanted to try to keep it straightforward uh, and simple. Um, so, the question I have is neurodevelopment. So many chemicals out there that we've associated with neurodevelopment effects. Is there enough confidence in the relationship <clears throat> that they're being established that it could not be due to variables like um, pesticides, which are much more ubiquitous in some locations and much higher concentrations, lead in non American non-U.S. countries. I'm, I'm a little leery about that issue because of the fact there's so many other, and taking into account organics, I mean, my goodness, they're everywhere. So I'm, I'm a little leery about neuro. Your concern is with um, other co-exposures mm -hmm. as, as confounders. Um, you know, of, of course, in these studies, they can measure, you know, one or two classes of chemicals, maybe three, but they can't account for, for those. So you'd have to make the argument that they are co varying the same way as the um, phthalate exposure is with the outcomes, so that people that have high DEHP exposure also have high lead exposure or have high mercury exposure. Or the other issue is, is that they have low exposure to, to pesticides or to lead, and that this is the variable that exists that, you know, rises above the concentrations of everything else, of the exposures, so that it, it is a meaningful exposure in its own right. I, I, I just a little leery of it because it becomes, it becomes a nightmare when you're dealing with neurodevelopment and the fact that we have so much in terms of pesticides that we deal with and lead in burden some areas that uh, do not um, not necessarily controlled as well as the United States. Personal yeah. products too for lead too. Well most of the prospective studies were done in, in the U.S. Okay. Um, Mount Sinai School of Medicine and Shauna Swan I think it was done at when she was at U, U Rochester. Well the pest, that's what I worry the about. the two cross-sectional were the Korean Yeah the, the cross-sectional for the Korean I worry a little bit about the non-American distribution of that with respect to Mount Sinai, there still is the, the issue of pesticides because yes, they've had... the urban environment, yeah. And also PDBEs, which have been studying for years, too. So anyway, that's, I'm just raising a note of caution on that, on that area. Yeah, and I was going to raise the question, you know, in terms of what we focused on in the... or, or what the toxicological literature points to in terms of anti-androgenic um, mode of action of phthalates, I don't think in the tox literature we've discussed at all um, effects of phthalates on neurodevelopment. So in terms of the 
biological plausibility. The papers um, differ in, I think, that the SWAN study looked at play behavior, so really trying to look at sexually dimorphic differences, which could be related to um, exposure of the developing brain to you know, steroid hormones or, or different levels during development. The other studies were, were looking more at um, executive function or attention deficit, hyperactivity disorder, et cetera. So I, I would put those separately. But apart from the SWAN study, I think one of the questions, too, is in terms of the, the tox literature. Is there anything there uh, in terms of neurodevelopment and then how to frame this? Because it's, it's uh, five, six parts, pages of the report. There's more literature on the neurodevelopmental outcomes in phthalates than there are on the genital development. There may be three versus, let's say, six or seven studies. How will we frame this in terms of our conclusions? I know it's not part of um, the approach that, that Holger and, you know, or not really potentially that relevant to what you were looking at, you know, in terms of the hazard index, the anti-androgen, apart from maybe the SWAN study, looking at the play behavior. The, the way it is now, it's there. Um, if it's part of the report, which it, it should be for completeness, how will readers interpret it? How will it potentially be used with the gap that we have in the, the talks literature? Or maybe there's literature I'm not familiar with, and you know I've only seen the anti-androgenic literature. So I don't know if Burn or Phil. There's a, a few. Yeah, I think there are a few animal studies that hint at uh, uh, neurobehavioral effects. Uh, looking at the the structure of the sexually dimorphic nucleus in the brain and some of the behaviors, uh, reproductive behaviors in the offspring when they grow up. So I'll try to dig up at least the ones I've seen that I came across. But could it be approached the same way that we did in the um, NAS report that uh, we consider the reproductive part just the most sensitive and that of course there could be other endpoints mm -hmm. and then just is going to focus on the most sensitive, but maybe that means there needs to be at least a other endpoint short description in the top section or um, Well, when the NAS report was written, like, it's probably, what, two or three years now, so <clears throat> most of these papers, the human were, data were not published. So at the time, I think when we were saying most sensitive, it was based on the animal data. But at this point, even two or three short years later, there's now you know, five or six of these papers that have come out. So um, not that I'm making this argument, but someone could basically say, well, if you looked at the human data, you have really just the SWAN AGD study. But on the neuro side, you have these five or six studies, albeit you know, there's different endpoints, and I'm not an expert in neurodevelopmental testing to know the overlap, you know, if you, because they're all using different outcome measures, but they're all seeing associations. So at least on the human data side, you can say that there's more evidence on the neurodevelopmental effects than there are on the genital effects, you know, six versus one or two studies. But I, I agree, at the time when the NAS report was put together, these, these studies were not published. Um, the SWAN study was. And the animal data was clearly um, showing that the most sensitive endpoints would be the anti-androgenic. I think it would be risky to attempt to convince anybody that the neuro and the endocrine effects are just totally different considerations. They're all connected as well as the immune responses. So because these organ systems all talk to each other and are all, they all have overlapping control mechanisms, <clears throat> there may be species differences in expression of 
manifestations, but probably have underlying mechanisms that are triggered by similar chemicals and just tr triggered at a slightly different level of sensitivity in different species. But th I certainly wouldn't deny that there is no relation. I, I would certainly not say that there is no relationship between what appears to be a neural effect in one species and a, and a, neuro, and a neuroendocrine effect in another species. They're, they're just too interconnected to sort them out that way with our level of knowledge today. Are you suggesting that we describe that or, or note that in the report? Because currently, I think in the, the talks or the animal section that there's Mike said there's some papers that, that can be added to it, but in terms of trying to link the tox studies with the human studies and the human studies across endpoints link as well, how should we approach that in, in the report? It may not hurt to make a statement that because, it, because there's more, first of all, because there's more literature on the neural than there is on the endocrine effect in humans doesn't mean that one is more important than the other. Right. might mean that one is easier to study than the other, yeah. or there's more grant money available for one rather than the other. So I'm not sure that's a good indicator of the seriousness of the, the response, but I also think it wouldn't hurt for us to have a statement in there that to conclude that there is an, uh, an effect on one organ system in the human and a different organ system in the rodents. Um, it may be premature to draw any conclusions about that because we would expect these are these are related at a lower level of biology. I, I completely agree that you know the, the number of publications you know it ha has to do with the the ease of doing the study, the data that's available. you know there's a lot of pregnancy cohorts that are funded, so yeah. they, they have that neuro data already, so I, I would definitely not use that yeah. as a criteria, but um, someone who's not that familiar with the field and, and looks at the literature will say, well, you have these studies pointing in this direction, but you, you know, you just have one study done in, in this, so I think we just need to be very clear in terms of the, the link or that they're not, potentially not completely separate. But also, uh, it's important that we have the ability to say that the reference doses we've chosen, you know, that are based on the reproductive side, are the right reference doses. I mean, if, if we're worried about neurodevelopment, is that something that would be more sensitive? And so that's what I'm saying. If we make some comment about what we think may be the most sensitive, that's what drives how you choose the reference dose, right? Andre, do you, do you think we should be delving into the neurodevelopment in this, in this analysis as deeply as I think we're heading, or do we continue to focus on what we think are the what we think is the major issue for the risk at this particular time, and leave it for research to establish whether there is or is not a plausible link? I think we should be careful. I mean, two years ago, I agree with everything that was said before. Two years ago, it really looked like uh, the um, developmental endpoints were the most sensitive, but um, two years is a long time in research. And if there are no in indications that other endpoints are either equally sensitive or even more, then I think we should note that. It is quite a separate question whether the information currently available will enable us to quantitate this in terms of points of departure, etc. But I think we should note this, um, assess it, and if we come to a conclusion that it may be more sensitive than the points of departure based on developmental toxicity, we should make a note of that and then exercise more caution in coming to estimates of so-called tolerable of safe doses without being able to quantify it, but we should take note. I would be surprised if there were developmental tox studies that looked at neural developmental endpoints for phthalates. Don't you 
Well, my, I mean, we should look. Mike but mentioned I, a few animal studies. Yeah, I mean, they're not, I don't think there's a lot. But I mean, in terms of dose response studies that we can derive a, a Noel from, I, I, would, I, we should look, but I would be surprised. I, I don't think. I don't think the uh, published studies will allow us to, to derive new, new Nobels, but maybe there are indications in what direction it, it points. All I'm saying is we, we should double look. check yes, and, we should look. if necessary, make cautionary statements. Yep. Good point. I'll, I'll go on. Uh, the, the third section, and, and the question is how to integrate this and in where um, are two papers, I haven't completed writing this section, but reproductive hormones in infants and their association with phthalates. So this is the, um, the main study and the Bo BOAS study in which they, um, the main study, prospective Danish-Finnish study in which they looked at breast milk concentrations of phthalates and serum reproductive hormones in male infants at three months of age. Um, and in describing the associations, it's it's rather complex because you know there are associations with some hormones, others not, different directions, multiple hormones measured. So it's it it's not a simple outcome. Um, and then the there was the Boas study, which was 845 children four to nine years of age, and they measured um, thyroid hormones, IGF-1, and uh, insulin-like growth factor binding protein 3 and looked at associations with urinary concentrations of phthalates. Um, haven't completed uh, writing that. So I thought of, of these papers as um, you know, really providing, in a way, background or potential mode of action information in relation to phthalates and some of the Hormones and especially trying to focus on um, the um, steroid hormones and specifically testosterone. So um, that was discussed quite extensively in the main study, in which they looked at measured LH and free testosterone and looked at ratios, etc. So it's it's now listed as section three um, potentially may make more sense to maybe follow the general develop genital development section in relation because it's in relation to hormones but if we're going to really include neurodevelopment as under the umbrella of being under also you know endocrine control and that the two may not be separate um, I'm not sure where to include it or at what level of detail at, at this point I've written, you can see that the description of the main study is, you know, a full page and the BOAS will probably be as well. You know, is this too much detail? Where should it be uh, in the report? Um, it, it's not a clinical outcome in the sense that these, it's not like these children had, you know, abnormal levels or clinically would be considered um, at risk or to have a condition. This is looking at these biochemical markers and looking at distributions and shifts in distributions. No, I think I think the level of details you give is good and it should should stay. Should stay in. Can I, uh, while we're discussing Maine et al. 2005, ask um, Holger to give us your opinion on um, analyses of phthalates in breast yes. milk and mother's milk. Um, I'm aware of uh, all the contamination issues there, etc. Could you uh, give us an opinion, Holger, as to the reliability of such measurements? It's always problematic to measure the phthalates and the phthalate metabolites in breast milk because of, as you said, the contamination issues of the monoester metabolites. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what they measured mainly here in, 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 in the breast milk. So I, I would be very careful over interpreting especially the <coughs> breast milk data. So despite the fact that they measured metabolites, so 
it's the monoester metabolites, and they can easily be generated uh, in the breast milk out of the omnipresent parent phthalate because the, the breast milk is high in lipase activity. And therefore, uh, uh, we have, especially with, with breast milk, always a contamination problem. So this is an abstract from one paper that I was thinking of where they, they're looking at gene expression changes uh, in the, a sexually dimorphic portion of the brain in animals. And the other papers that I was thinking of are have to do with, they're from Gray and others, they have to do with sexual behavior. Um, so, the, the, you know, there's not a lot, but there's a, a hint of something in the animals. C could you perhaps circulate your collection, Mike? Absolutely. Fantastic. Thank you. So the moving on, the next section for pubertal Russ, develop. Yes. Coming back to, to what uh, Andreas pointed out. I would really prefer maybe to have the, the BOAS 2010 publication to, to be a bit more, a bit elaborated oh, here. Yeah, I, I haven't finished that yet. Yeah, I, I wrote up the main and then I realized it potentially maybe too detailed or and I started working on the BOAS and then I said, I'll, I'll stop here and wait and see what level of detail. But yes, you're right, there's, that's, not, that's not done. And I should then work in um, what you just mentioned about measuring metabolites in breast milk, a sentence or two on that. So the next section is pubertal development, gynecomastia. Um, so I just put a note here, uh, need to discuss phthalates are not estrogenic in experimental studies and in terms of um, considering the relevance of these studies on telarchy and um, gynecomastia. And we're probably all familiar with the Cologne study for, from Puerto Rico, which was published in 2000, which was probably one of the first human studies looking at phthalates in, in an endpoint. Um, and then there's been a few other studies in which they've tried to look at um, phthalates in pubertal development or, or gynecomastia. Generally, uh, very small studies. The next one is the Dermaz and colleagues, published 2010. And this is looking at um, pubertal gynecomastia cases in 21 H match control children. Um, and then another study by Lomenick, another small study, 28 girls with central precocious puberty and 28 match. Can I just make a comment about the uh, estrogenicity or otherwise of, of phthalates? I think it's not generally true that uh, phthalates are not estrogenic. There are, BBP for example is an in vitro estrogenic chemical. The, the problems with, um, there are problems with reproducibility in in vitro assays which are more to do I think with the complications associated with controlling the phthalate concentrations because they stick to everything. But I don't think, well, it, there are certain phthalates that are weakly estrogenic. That's not been taken forward as we know with, with all the um, male reproductive uh, developmental toxicity studies because uh, it is viewed there. The view is that for those effects other mechanisms play a stronger role than estrogenicity. So I, I acknowledge that but I think it is not quite right to say phthalates are devoid of estrogenic activity. Certain phthalates are also in vitro estrogens. So that should be reflected in the yeah. talk section. In or you could briefly make reference to the relevant studies here. Or leave it out. Or what? Leave it out. Leave out the human or leave out the... No, no, no. Um, yeah, I th no. Actually, the best would be to make brief reference here to the relevant in vitro studies. Because this section is really devoid of any 
um, description of talk studies. It can reference back to what was described, but because uh, I haven't done it with mm. the other endpoints as I well. I think this section sh should st stay in. It's valuable. It needs to be discussed okay. and quoted. And I think all you need to um, link it to some kind of mechanism is to trial. say there are indications that certain phthalates are estrogenic and then put in the relevant references. And you have some of those references? I, I do, yeah. But isn't what the bigger picture, Russ, isn't, isn't it that what we really need is some sort of glue that sort of just describes all these different sections, but there's certainly things that are going to be left out, and if there's some general discussion, maybe in the talk section, that describes, you know, here's, they're generally anti-androgens, but they are also estrogenic, they are, you know, but we're going to focus in this direction. I mean, Right, because this is, I didn't conduct a full review of every endpoint. I mean, I tried to choose them based on life stage and exposure and, and outcome um, that I thought would be relevant to what we see in the tox literature. I agree. I mean, I think they're, they're yeah. Russ, but you definitely have to be aware that a lot of the studies cited there are very weak and some are really questionable in terms of approach, quality, analytical quality. Yes. Yeah. And uh, I think it's okay to cite them just to, so, to, to, to show that we are aware of them, but I would be really careful with yeah, some no, of the I, studies. I agree. Um, I, I mean, I say all these studies were very small limiting power and several had important limitations and methods used to assess the phthalate exposure. But I mean, I, I agree. I mean, none of them are, you know, any bigger than 20 or 30 um, children. Um, the other one that I didn't describe was the ECMO study by Raz Parami, which had 19, 19 children, and they were, you know, basically using ECMO as a marker for high exposure. But it is both the analytical. Time to go. It is both the analytical approach. And the and the and the methodology. So on the one hand, of course, it's a small sample size, but on the other hand, uh, also for many of the studies, the analytical results are very questionable. Very questionable. Yeah, I would really say unreliable. So why do we quote it? Why why we? Why, why waste the space? I mean, you have to be really careful when you put stuff in that may be unreliable. If we discuss the, the sample size, it's already over exaggerating the, the qual quality right. of the work. That's right. Well, I think uh, our, our job is to review and assess available evidence. We, I think we should deal with it and then make these, um, these comments. It's no big deal. Yeah, I mean, I'm, it's mentioned maybe not as strongly as you want. Like, you know, uh, there is concern with contamination of blood samples. There's it's analytic, perfect. so it's we, but, yes. but we can make it. I mean, I'd welcome if you know had in, rather than saying it's had important limitations, we can say had important analytical limitations, or or had we can make it stronger, or we can make it more more detailed. So if you know, it's and I didn't spend it, you know for these four or five studies, I basically wrote about you know a page and a half or so which I think reflects the importance of them, but I'd welcome, you know, anything specific you want to add in terms of the analytical limitations or how to describe it. I mean, I think all of them had that problem, uh, apart from the Raz Barami paper, which didn't assess exposure or didn't measure exposure in, in blood or urine. So, yeah, so as the they use blood, some of these studies, they measured the diester. I mean, there's... And then the, the, the so Hogar, if I welcome any few words or editing, whatever you feel is necessary. Um, and then based on the last meeting, um, we talked about whether to include a section on adult exposure and semen quality. 
because of the relevance of the endpoint. Um, and we decided that that would, you know, basically be very brief and just cite, you know, the eight or ten, I don't know how many are here, studies, um, and then just conclusion that, you know, the data seems to be inconsistent. You know, some studies do find an association, some don't, and it's uh, about a half a page or so. Um, and I, this was based on our discussion where we felt it needed to be there, but don't put a lot of uh, weight on it or detailed description. So those are, it's, it's really four or five different endpoints, which I think were chosen to fit in with what our charge is and what the tox literature points to. One question I have is the, the whole issue of spot urine versus 24-hour collection. Um, I'm assuming that some of these studies had the 24-hour, others had spot urine. I, I didn't really notice too much. I think of most of them or all of them had spot urine. I don't so, remember any with 24-hour urine. So do we need to bring up the limit, the potential limitations or the, my, maybe I wouldn't say limitations as much as I do remember, Russ, I don't remember if it was your paper or maybe you were referenced in a paper but that talked about the, uh, what was the word, ubiquitous, uh, no, the omnipresence of, or something like that, of the exposure to these chemicals. So although, you know, you may have a spot urine today and then next week, the distribution ends up being about the same. Um, from even from a spot, so that there was a conclusion. On a population on a level. population, so yeah. there was a conclusion that from a population perspective, a spot urine was reasonable to, so would that be worth, um, Make that statement. I there were some, pa was it a Tetelon paper that addressed, that had the longitudinal versus the, we had published, we, we looked at, um, it was small, number of individuals that had repeat samples, you know, let's say nine or ten, and then we did a simulation exercise, we pretended, we, we took that as the gold standard of what their exposure would have been, divide them into turtiles, and then do an exercise where you say, well, if you had only taken the first sample from everyone, how well would it have predicted which turtile they were in if you took the second sample, how well? And then you can get a sensitivity and specificity. I, that's probably, you know, with, and the sensitivity and specificity are about 60, 70 percent, which is not I awful, it's but it's not great. You know, it's not fantastic, but it's, it's informative. Yeah, yeah. But there is a lot of exposure misclassification because you're taking a spot sample and it's reflecting that individual's exposure. And even if you take it a different time of day, you're going to have a different measure in the urine or rel relative to when they ate, relative to when they used some of the products that contain phthalates. So even within a day, a mm -hmm. few hour difference That's can right. make large differences in their urinary levels. I, I just can't see making that statement. Too many variables and there's too much uncertainty. Spot samples are fine, but they just don't reflect the day or the reality but, of what what people are exposed to because there's so much variability from day to day hour to hour and but I think the, the papers like what what um, Russ was a part of are helpful to sort mm -hmm. of put a frame around that there may be a lot of variability from hour to hour but it's still people who were low at one point ended up there's some info I mean Paul point. you would you would agree that there's some information in that spot urine sample Yes, there is, but not necessarily but, but coherence between that and the 24-hour. I mean, we'll get shot shot down making a statement. Oh, no, like not that. between the but, but there is some information in helping classify individuals into quartiles or into... Sure, but I, I wouldn't even come close to trying to equate the two. Cause Maybe I misspoke to bring up the 24-hour. Maybe really what is interest... The reason I say that is because in the biomonitoring part of what we're doing, we're saying there are people with low levels and people with high levels. So, so how reproducible, if, you, if somebody ends up being high in a spot urine, do they tend to be high later? With sensitivity and specificity of whatever you said, maybe it's pretty good. I mean, it's not perfect. There are limitations, but at least it, it, it evaluates that in, with those Holger, kinds of could papers. you make that statement and live with it? 
I wouldn't even go that far. No, neither would I. Um, I. I think we can come back to our discussion from yesterday about variability and uncertainty. It is not only a question of spot urine samples compared to 24-hour urine samples. We all have to be aware that the phthalate exposure is high one day, low the other day. So it is merely a picture of the reality we are seeing. It, it is not only an issue of, of the spot right. urine and the 24-hour urine. What you have seen and described is important that the ones who are in the upper quartiles are very likely to be possibly at the next measurements also in the upper quartile. But it doesn't really mean, it doesn't really, it isn't really sure about that, no. that they are. No, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's not absolute, but, but there is information there. And when you calculate a sensitivity and specificity, it's telling you how much information there, how much predictive ability there is. It's definitely not 100 percent or anywhere near that, but it's, you know, you're not down at 20, 30 percent. So, I mean, I think statistically you would probably call a 70 percent sensitivity or specificity is providing some information, but, yeah, within a day the, the levels are changing. So if that person comes in and gives you that sample at 10 in the morning versus 4 in the afternoon, there's going to be differences and then day to day and week to week. And, and they're real, they're real differences. Yes. Okay, I'm going to call a, a close to this because we, we've got okay. to be finished by 11.15 when the council comes back. And we still have Chris and, and Holger to Can I make one? Can, yeah. We, we have a paper actually under re review now um, looking at variability of phthalates over time. And I think it's about 120 or 30 women where we have up to 10 or 15 repeat samples and before they're pregnant and during pregnancy. And we calculate our intraclassic correlation coefficients. We look at whether there's changes over trimester pregnancy, et cetera. So, uh, you know, hopefully that paper will come in, come out in the in the fall. It's under review now, but it could provide some information on variability and also during pregnancy as well. Yeah. So, it's it's much larger than the original paper we published. Okay, so Chris and Holger, you've got the microphone for the last 30 minutes or 25 minutes now. So this is uh, tab 11. Um, there are some updates that, that this report here doesn't have, namely um, some of the excretions. There's uh, an updated paper that um, Holger reminded me of that he sent me and I didn't catch the email. But um, So in the table one on page four of the report, uh, these, some of these um, excretion factors need to be updated just a bit. Um, so it's, it's not going to change drastically what's going on, but there will be the, the numbers of what's here will be, will be different. Um, the other thing is, so maybe Holger, do you want to talk about yeah, we, the it is Actually, this fine tuning we are doing right now, and uh, two major publications came to our notice or came out in the recent uh, weeks. One was, uh, as you said, the publication by uh, Anderson et al. in Food and Chemical Toxicology. It is now a 20 volunteer study investigating the metabolism of DEHP and DINP. So uh, this data uh, now puts our assumptions on metabolic conversion factor, which we use to extrapolate from urinary metabolite levels to the dose. Uh, on a more solid ground because the numbers we use uh, have been based on only one single volunteer. So these numbers are now based on uh, 20 volunteers. And uh, we have minor. Just to give you an example, um, we assumed uh, the DHP metabolites, the, the, five, uh, the four metabolites we measure to um, represent approximately 
60% of the oral dose. And now, with the Andesnet Al publication, publication, it would be 45% of the dose. So, uh, absolutely, this is a difference of 15%, so relatively, it's, it's a difference of uh, 20 to 30%, which in the end would increase the doses we calculate from urinary metabolite levels. So, for the increment of DHP in our hazard index, the doses would increase by approximately 20 to 30 percent using these novel, more reliable conversion factors based on 20 volunteers. So that, that's, that is one major development. And uh, the second major development is for our, relevant for our case two. That is the publication by Hannas et al. That is a publication from uh, the EPA multi-dose uh, program on phthalates from Earl Grace group. And uh, as I pointed out yesterday, this is a good approach to measure the relative potencies of the phthalates by uh, comparing the, the different dose response curves for uh, the various phthalates investigated. And uh, in this HANA's publication, uh, the, the, the most important uh, um, finding is they compare diisobutyl phthalate, uh, DEHP, and uh, DINP. And while, uh, as we have already pointed out in our case too, uh, N-butyl, butyl benzyl, and uh, DEHP are roughly equipotent, they now, uh, we now have a very reliable potency factor for DINP, diisononyl phthalate. And they state that uh, regarding testosterone production, uh, DINP is uh, less potent by a factor of 2.3. So we use these uh, potency estimations uh, based on the most robust endpoint NOEL for DHP of uh, 5 milligrams per kilogram per day. And from this NOEL or TDI, we calculate the other TDIs based on the potency estimations from this study in our case too. So having a TDI of 50 for DHP multiplying a factor of 2.3 we come to a TDI or a reference dose of around 115 for DINP. So this is one major development from this study. So what we're proposing um, is to have three cases that we'll carry through. Um, the first case is based on the Court and Kemp and Faust um, reference doses. The second case will be uh, based on this idea of uh, calculating the reference doses really from the foundation of DEHP and then using real to potency ideas to uh, generate other uh, reference doses. And then the third case would be a combination of the work of Byrne and, and uh, Mike or Phil to um, to uh, come up with a reprotox sort of um, uh, reference dose um, that we would reference then from internally. So the idea would be, you know, hopefully they'll be a lot different, <laughs> and that will actually we can assess then how sensitive our results might be based on the assumptions of the reference doses. My feeling is is that it's not going to matter too much. You know, I don't think we should split hairs about what, anyway. So I think there's going to be value to seeing um, three different uh, case studies that we carry through. So as soon as we get those, then we'll work, work through that. So what I was going to do is just sort of talk through what's here now. And uh, I know last time people made suggestions. Some of it we've con included it. If, best I remember if there are other things you want to include we can do that but if you don't mind if we could just sort of step through the pages would that be agreeable okay so um, I thought they were page but the uh, the first page of the results section um, so the first thing that we're looking at are um, analysis of data from in Haynes 2005 and 6 uh, pregnant women um, in that version of in Haynes there were 300 and some odd 382 women who were coded as pregnant, uh, but only 130 of them actually had phthalates um, evaluated on them. So the analysis is based on those 130. Um, the table three there on, on that same page, so 
what I was trying to do there was to give some sense of uh, what, if you think about each person then is sort of their own, you know, it's a different exposure mixture um, for each woman, each pregnant woman. Um, so to give some sense of that distribution, uh, one way might be to, to look at what's the percentage um, of the contribution for each um, estimated daily intake value uh, per woman. And so what you see in table three is if you, if you add everybody's up and then figure out what the percentage is and then take the average of that per um, phthalate, then you see that um, DEHP, with, with this calculation anyway, uh, is about 37% uh, average of the mixture, and that's much, well, pretty much bigger than, than the others. DINP comes in second there. So, of course, these numbers will change with the new calculations, but... Um, so that this sort of way of looking at it, and the other thing that I think is helpful is to see um, the variation there by looking at the minimum and the maximum. So, for example, the DEHP, there was one woman who had only 5% of her mixture, you know, was DEHP, and another woman had 99% of her mixture was DEHP. Um, and similarly, I mean, there was one woman who had 87% of her mixture was DIDP. So there's a lot of variation in terms of what the exposures are, but I think one value of this approach is we're putting all these different mixtures into and giving a distribution from the hazard index. Um, so if you think of a better way of combining them instead of just summing them, but um, what's here is just the sum of the daily intake estimates. And, and again, but this sum. table three is just the intake, not the... Not the hazard index, just the intakes, right. The relative intakes, right. Table four on the next page um, okay. is a Sorry. Okay. Yes, sir. just a question. Um, maybe that's just been answered. The in table three, these percentages they are the percentages of the hazard quotients to the overall hazard index, or what? No, are this is not hazard index, it's just the daily intakes. Oh, okay, so every Fine. woman has a the different daily intakes, there are some, and then it's the average, I mean, the percent of those, and then the across the chemicals. Um, table four, um, again, this was a request from last time, which I think is kind of helpful. Um, these are just Pearson correlation coefficients uh, for um, the uh, different daily intake estimates. And Holger pointed out yesterday that it looks like, I guess, the DBP, BBP, and the, I don't know, the DEHP there, whichever way you put that. But there's, there's low molecular weight and then higher molecular weight sort of clusters of correlations, which might be interesting in terms of exposure. And, and we consider the EHP a high molecular weight phthalate. Right. Sorry, didn't mean to step into anything there, <laughs> because it is. Um, right, and so, uh, so you see along the diagonal there, and a little bit off the diagonal, the, uh, some of that's highly correlated in terms of uh, correlations there. The next sections are just the calculations of the hazard index for each of the three cases. Uh, what's here is all going to change, so I don't want to spend too much time going, going through this, but if you just think about it in terms of the approach, um, but the numbers will change, you know, with these um, differences that Holger spoke about. Um, one thing that we're doing then is with the, with the enhanes, we have this opportunity to actually try to model some of these uh, hazard indices as a function of various things. You all may have ideas of what else to include here. So I'm, I'm at the top of page nine on the right-hand side there. Um, I'm actually trying to model the estimated hazard index per subject as a function of body mass index, age, race, poverty index, marital status, education level. I mean, there could be other things. Um, and maybe you all can think of other things. In this sort of model building strategy, I ended up with a body mass index being negatively associated with the hazard index and age being positively associated. And, and other things sort of dropped out of the model. Um, I don't really have an explanation for that. Maybe we, it's worth some kind of comment there. Um, but I, if you have other ideas of covariates, I mean, we could, you know, in Haines has got a lot of things we could look at. Um, but maybe with some thought. So, and then, what, but interestingly then, I, I kind of use that same model building strategy 
for the for the other two cases here in the next couple pages, and we end up with about the same thing. So that's I think saying that it's not reference dose dependent in terms of these associations. Um, body mass index and age coming up. May I remind ourselves of the discussions we had yesterday about the issues of exposure and uses and non-uses. So looking at the distributions we have here, I think very typically we often see some people, some individuals really being apart from the others. So I think this is something that uh, that we are waiting for from, from the external exposure side to give us the info on where might be some highly exposed individuals that we see here also in the in the biomonitoring extrapolations. So this is not a bell shape. It's not a bell it is it is certainly yeah. so, yeah. or is it bimodal? I think it's just the tail thing. But the, I think what you're saying then is maybe from the, ex, the other exposure analysis, important variables will come up and then maybe that will suggest mm -hmm. covariates that we could figure out. Exactly. Are those the ones that sort of explain these higher levels? That would be kind of cool. Okay. And then sort of this section will be, so on the bottom of page 10, um, right now the summary of sort of the three cases, you know, that's going to change as the numbers change, but we're seeing pretty much some agreement. It, it turns out what was here, cases two and three were more similar than case one, but they're still pretty, pretty close in terms of about, um, uh, what was it? I think about 10 percent, is that right? Yeah, I think about 10 percent of the um, uh, estimates uh, or above, above one. Um, that was for case one. Now that's going to change a little bit with the um, with the new calculations. But but you know we're seeing right on that sort of upper tail uh, for all of these cases, which I think is informative. Again, it's not going to be dependent. I think in terms of what the assumptions are for the largely speaking for the reference doses. So. Um, that helps. So that discussion up to that point is only looking at um, the seven, the seven phthalates, um, which were summarized at the top of Table Five. The bottom of part of Table Five is going to those data come up later, but it's just here just to put them all together. Um, Can I just ask a question? Yes. It, the in a, in a previous draft, you you listed the uh, contribution of the various phthalates to the um, hazard index uh, as it varies uh, from case one, two, and three, or three is new. Um, and I seem to remember that in case one, um, mostly DEHP contributed to the um, hazard index. In case two, that changed. Um, what about case three? Right. So that was in the earlier version. If you'd like that, we can put it back in. In this version, I, I, I was thinking that that was um, maybe more succinctly described by that table that was just based on daily intakes and not based on the denominators of the hazard index. But if, if you'd like, if you like that, they, they, I didn't get the feeling everybody liked that last time, so I... Well, it's an important piece of information. It tells you um, it tells you whether we're really dealing with a mixture effect or whether just one or a few phthalates dominate what's happening. In terms of the in terms of the hazard index. Yeah. Okay, so we can put that put those tables back in. So the, the next part, so this section now on the bottom, there's not a page number, but the bottom of page 11, um, this now, this little section is written just now for case one. It will be extended to cases two through and, two and three as well. Um, 
But largely what we're trying to focus on here is the idea that, uh, so we have hazard indices just based on phthalates. Now what about the other antiandrogens? So available in NHANES um, are um, biomonitoring data for bisphenol A and butyl and um, whatever the other paraben is, propyl paraben. Um, and so we use the same kind of approach to build up um, daily intake estimates for those three additional antiandrogens. Uh, and, and then the other thing is the Court and Camp and Faust paper had, I think, seven other um, chemicals that they looked at for antiandrogens and, and provided uh, median intakes and higher uh, high-end uh, intakes. So w what I'm trying to do here is, like what you see on page 12, is adding from, the, say, this, um, uh, the seven phthalates by themselves, you get a certain distribution of the hazard index. If you add on top of that the three antiandrogens from the biomonitoring, it doesn't shift all of that much. It shifts a smidge up, um, and that's a scientific term. Um, but, then the, but then the other thing is we can take just the high intake median estimates, sorry, the median estimates from the other seven antiandrogens from the Court and Camp and Faust and the high intake estimates and see how it shifts up. And what happens is when in the most conservative case there, um, in case one, for the most conservative uh, case of adding the, um, the constant from the uh, high intake estimates, you're adding 0.593 units of hazard index to the baseline of the phthalates and the, and the uh, three other antiandrogens from the biomonitoring. And it goes up from about 10 percent above the um, uh, value of one, the distribution, up to about 14 percent. Of course, those numbers are going to change with the new calculations. But I think what you're seeing is the impact of it really matters what the denominator is, how many chemicals are you going to look at, and the more, you know, if you're assuming that we have a combination effect, the more you add, you know, potentially the, the further that distribution is going to shift. Um, so this is kind of an exercise um, to show that. Um, okay. So the next, the next part there on page 13, um, so now we switch to the Swanadel data. So um, the NHANES data, we don't have, uh, we only have one value from each pregnant woman. In the Swanadel data, we have pre and post natal va um, measurements and then uh, measurements on uh, babies um, up to age three, I think. Um, now, if you look at table seven there on page 13, these are the monoesters that were evaluated. Uh, we actually decided that instead of seven phthalates, we're here we're going to only look at six because we, are, we assumed that this um, mono-3 carboxypropyl phthalate wasn't specific enough to DNOP. And the other metabolite that we used from NHANES wasn't available in the SWAN data. So we're reducing now from seven to six um, with that. But otherwise, the calculations are the same as what we saw before. So we have 418 pregnant women here. 340 women had prenatal measurements. 336 had postnatal measurements. Um, it turns out that um, these women, the distribution of the age here in this figure, sorry, it's not numbered yet, but on page 13, that age distribution is a little bit older than the age distribution from NHANES. The NHANES distribution was a broader sort of range or, P, or I guess a fatter distribution in terms of age, um, but it's about four years or so shifted up. And in fact, the 25th percentile from NHANES was 21. Here, the 25th is 27, so at that end it's like six years. So it's a, this group is a little bit older, um, whatever that helps with. Okay, so in this, in this data then, a similar analysis um, on page 14. This is kind of an interesting table. This is now a little bit different than what you looked at before. This is the Pearson correlation estimates, but it's based on prenatal values correlated with postnatal values per woman. Right, pre and post. 
and so the diagonals aren't one. This is not just like the usual correlation table. Um, and the sample size now reduces because it's we only have 258 women who have both only I shouldn't say only, but who have both pre and post values. Okay, um, but for those two, sorry, 258 women who have pre and post for for DBP, DIBP, BBP, and DEHP, but the sample size reduces to only 18 for DINP and DIDP where there's both pre- and postnatal values. Okay, so be careful about the sample sizes there. That's what those asterisks mean. But largely what you're seeing here is very interesting, that we actually see correlations between pre- and post values. Um, I don't have data about, you know, when these measurements were taken prenatally and postnatally. Maybe we can look at Shauna's papers to find that out. I, don't, I have not tried to do that. Um, I don't know this specific data set, but I know in her paper it's around 28 weeks of gestation, the prenatal, so late in pregnancy. And the postnatal, I don't know how postnatally that is. I think the average, at least from the AGD papers, was about 12 months. Okay. So, you know, the fact that these are correlated, I think, may go to the fact that these, you know, behavior habit, whatever, it's very similar exposures. Weakly correlated. Weekly. Very, very weakly. Oh, guys. The pre and post. Pre and post, like yeah. So that's very weak. That, that's what, what we already discussed on. Okay, very weak, but still significant. Okay. Um, Okay, so uh, then what's here is just, you know, going through the cases again. These numbers will change with the new calculations. Um, but as, again, I want to point out that the distribution, I think, for the prenatal distribution and the postnatal distribution, you may say it's a weak correlation, but the distribution looks similar, okay? Um, And we'll see if that shows up still with the new calculations, yeah, but, but right. Which is correlation is not important as the way the But but look at better. But look at the similarities from case one though. The distributions on pages fourteen and fifteen, they're more similar. So there's must maybe there's a chemical there that's throwing that up. So we'll see what that looks like with the, with the new case. Yeah. Yeah, we can look at to think about. Okay, so going on then, so again, those numbers will change with the new calculations, but um, so, okay, infant data on page 19. Um, so we have uh, 291 infants ages 0 to 37. And you see in that tape, in that figure six, I don't know if it'll stay figure six, but um, you can see the age distribution there, so it's kind of clunky. Um, um, so one thing that we have made an assumption about was uh, in, the, in the published uh, use of this method for estimating daily intakes, uh, we've used a paper by Raymer et al to calculate um, the daily intakes in children. But that paper only was based on data from two to 18 years. 
So we made the assumption that um, for inference less than 90 centimeters uh, long, the creatinine excretion rate was assumed to be that for the 90 centimeter child. So that is an assumption we've made. Um, and I don't know, I mean, I guess we could kind of figure out how to study that, the impact of that, but so far I haven't done anything. I'm just pointing out that assumption. Um, okay, so now at the bottom, of, sorry about the page break here, but the bottom of page 19 and top of page 20, again, we're looking at correlation coefficients um, between now the top part of the table is the prenatal and the, the columns are the baby values or the infant values for the different chemicals. There were no baby pre-values that had the same sort of mother-child uh, combination for DINP and DIDP. There were some values then, though, for the postnatal, so that's why the, the block part there. Um, not a very strong association between the prenatal and the, po and the baby, um, but for the postnatal and the baby, I think there is Okay, you guys decide if it's strong or not, but it is significant, I can tell you that. Values about 0.3 uh, between DIBP um, for, for post and baby values, DIBP, BBP, um, DEHP, uh, about 0.3, point, point 0.38. Um, can I, can I um, express a word of caution to apply this kind of hazard index consideration to infants uh, for the simple reason that the um, potency estimates or the reference doses which which you use for that are are really for fetal life so I'm sorry I don't want to be a party pooper here but perhaps um, you know that that would complicate the the entire analysis, and I wonder whether we can whether this entire analysis cannot live without analyzing the infant data. Well, or, or is it possible to come up with a consideration of what the reference doses, how they should change? That, that's guesswork. There's no data for that. It's very difficult. But I think it's enough. Um, in my opinion, the whole thing can live without doing these considerations for infant data. Maybe just have the daily intake estimates, but not the hazard index for the infants? Yeah. Can do the daily intake estimates, but then the question is, what for? Show things like this correlation. Hmm. Andy, hmm? I think we felt obliged of including the infants because it, it's one of our tasks within the one of our duties. Yes. So yes, I would feel more comfortable if you wouldn't include uh, the the infants, but I think. We should at least do some exemplatory calculations here because it's our task here. Y yes, but the, the question then is one, can you actually do a, um, a, risk, uh, a risk assessment for, for infants? Okay. You know, it has, to be, it has to be credible and the data, as far as I can see, are simply not there to do this in a credible fashion. Our task is to look at toys. Yeah. So therefore, the infants, newborns, the newborns and the toddlers are both part of this. Oh, it would need a, a, a series of, of, of heavily qualifying statements. Well, I think we have to. If be, you do that. But I think we have to do it, but I think the point of putting heavily quali heavy qualifiers on mm. this is appropriate. But we we can't ignore it at all, otherwise we've. No, I'm not advocating to ignore it, but but. Uh, I agree about. I'm I'm putting in provisors here. I mean, the analysis we do has to be credible, really. Something that the that your chapters could address. 
are there are, are there tax papers out there for well in the in the animal studies the ju you know prenatal exposure is the most that's the most sensitive stage juvenile animals are more sensitive than adult animals adult animals you have to really Hammer them. high can so we, can we derive reference reference doses from postnatal studies might take some doing Largely just to see if if it's would would they change that much from what we already have it may not it may not be to actually derive new values as much as just to assess is there any reason to think they would be much different than I think like Mike said they would be different they would I think experience tells us that they would be higher mm -hmm. yeah. and how much higher um, I, I don't know I mean, it needs a bit of a biological reality check. I mean, the, the truth of the matter is that the vulnerable period is in fetal life. The damage is done in fetal life, not in, in neonatal life or postnatal life. For, for the things we are looking at, the damage is done in fetal life, if there is any in, damage. In rats, during the sexual in differentiation rats. that takes yeah. place in the rats at yeah. the end of the that's, first that's trimester, correct. which takes place in humans at the... Yeah. So you're, you're saying that our whole premise is wrong, that toys are significant, are insignificant? No, 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 the, no, 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 not at all. Because all the, you know, the damage occurs before okay. they're born? Not at no. Uh, I'm then, trying to understand Then there is further point. evidence to suggest that the damage done in fetal life, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's no recovery if you then have postnatal exposure. So that's all right, toys so you're come saying in. that you have a initiation stage yes. and then you have yeah. promotion stage if you want to you use want to just these that analogies kind of that would be correct yeah. yeah because otherwise then the whole analysis is useless for afterwards if there is no postnatal exposures of concern no I'm only, my point is only that for the postnatal period it is difficult to to use say approaches that can quantify it we know qualitatively that if exposure persists in postnatal life, you you help the okay. syndrome no, coming out. At least that's the evidence from from rats. All right, so it makes it makes me feel more more comfortable. Yeah. Because I first I was. Yeah. No, no, no. That, you were, don't you were don't don't misunderstand. Me statement. Hmm. Okay, fine. I'm I'm okay. The only problem I'm highlighting here is that for you know for for the postnatal period we we have. It is very difficult to quantify the um, the effect. I think I got your point. Mm -hmm. um, Great. We, we might very reliably estimate the exposure rather reliably, mm -hmm. but we shouldn't maybe do the last step of extrapolating to the hazard index. But we can say that the exposure of the infants is in the same region as the exposure of the pregnant woman, for example. That, that, that would be... That that piece of information would be important uh, mm -hmm. to then argue here, um, you know, mm -hmm. the damage, the damage done is, is promoted. What about, what about well, yeah. another approach? What about saying the conservatively yeah conservative can i can i just say though what we could do is use the reference doses that we've got and then do a little sensitivity analysis and say suppose it's off a factor of 10 multiply each reference dose by 10 and, and see what the impact of that is without knowing more. I mean, I don't think what you're saying is it doesn't matter what the exposure is. But you're saying we don't no, quantify, we opposite. don't know how to he's quantify saying, it. He's so saying the I'm opposite. He's saying exposure does matter. 
that's my point, is that instead of, instead of not having a hazard index, let's just say, it, it, suppose it's 10 times the reference doses shift by a, fact, by, you know, a whole order of magnitude, what happens? Okay. Well, play, play we can play game. with. I, I think you. I think you make a good point, Chris. And I think we just have to play with the numbers once we get some exposure values to see, in fact, where we come down on this issue, because that's going to be important in terms of how we look at this postnatal exposure question, which is the relevant question for what we have to do. And Andreas, would you say that the postnatal exposures, in that case, the 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 infants are going to be no more sensitive than during fetal exposure. No more sensitive. Hmm. Yeah. Or would you say we have no idea? Or would you say that using the prenatal values, it, it um, you're not going to underestimate the risk, you may overestimate it. Yeah, it's just, uh, it's just like comparing um, apples with pears slightly. And it, you, you have to look at it qual qualitatively based on animal evidence. And, and based on animal evidence, we know the damage is done in fetal life. Mm -hmm. But if exposure to phthalates persists postnatally, it comes out stronger. Okay. Um, I'm fine with where we are. It's just a matter of seeing what the exposure data comes up with and what you do then with the relative magnitude of the factor. With the discussion we had earlier about there could be neurodevelopmental effects that it could be in the same ballpark of what we're looking at. There's, you know, some epidemiology sort of evidence of something, you know, I, I don't think we should, I, I mean, I would propose that we keep on with this idea of a hazard index, but just with more of flags around it saying well, these reference doses are not a set. Maybe conservatively they are, um, we wouldn't expect it to be more sensitive. So we just have conservative to be, we just have to, I think, as saying that we have to lay out the stuff and put the, as just as we're going to have to put the uncertainties around the exposure issues, we're going to have to put the uncertainties around the dose and hazard index, especially for uh, children, because it's, it's going to be really different. And I think being upfront about it, and I don't think we have to bring in the idea that there are other effects at this point. I think we just have to be very careful in how we phrase it. But, and is it reasonable to, that even because it's children or, or infants that you'd have another uh, uncertainty factor added anyway? Ultimately, you know, your attempt, what you're trying to do at this stage is quantify the unquantifiable at this stage because, you know, we, you can only argue qualitatively. There's no data, at least to my knowledge, that would help you quantify it. Mm -hmm. I agree, totally agree. You, you have to take yeah. a step back at this point and yeah. see where we, we are yeah. in September. I really do. I think mm -hmm. we just have to step back. But, but it's no problem. Mm -hmm. I don't see a problem. I agree with that. We just have to see where it comes. I would like to point out, though, that what we're seeing is that the, with the calculations that's done now, that the hazard indexes for the babies is bigger than for the, than for the uh, pre- and postnatal values. So, so if the reference doses, I mean, they could go up some and still be, you know, in the same ballpark as the women. Um, I agree that, you know, I, I just don't want to say we can't do anything. I think we can place it with some flags around it. Anyway. Any orders are Okay. That's easy. Okay, so then finally, and I know we gotta wrap up, but just, can I just say finally though, um, 
in the summary of the results, it seems to me we need to discuss uh, how we're going to interpret this. And so something about, um, you know, maybe we could put a summary table about the percentages above one or, you know, in the neighborhood of one, whatever, but then have a discussion of, you know, what this value of one means. Uh, we're not really hypothesis testing. It's more of a, uh, you know, guide of some more concern, the closer or the higher the percentage above one. Um, so some discussion about that. Um, and I guess my final point was, based on the discussion Mike had earlier, uh, those questions that you had written down, it made me think, um, do we want to look at distributions of the hazard indices um, per component, uh, you know, actually produce the plots for that instead of just summary values like, like I had before um, that might be. You do used. have the percentages or. Well, I, I took out the hat. I took yeah, those yeah. tables out. We can yeah. put those back or put some plots in, I, which may be helpful as well. Um, So one more thing is I think that there, even in spite of the age difference in the women, I think there were quite a, I looked through the daily intake distributions from the uh, Shauna Swans data and from the NHANES, and they're pretty similar distributions. So I think, uh, you know, it's, it's in two different data sets, it's pretty similar daily intake estimates. Do you want to invite the council to come in? At this time, uh, the CPSC General Counsel, uh, Cheryl Falvey, will join us. Hi. So I understand that yesterday there was a fair amount of discussion about peer review. I haven't watched the tape, and so I wasn't, um, I don't know everything that you talked about. I've gotten a little bit of briefing in between other meetings today. Um, and so I thought it would be helpful for us to lay out what the important considerations are if you go down the route of peer review um, and give you some context as to how we view your work um, because we view you as an extraordinary super peer review group already. Peer reviewing prior CHAP's work on DEHP is that right, DEHP and DINP that were done in the past. And we have a layered process here where we have Congress asking for the formation of a CHAP to go even further than those prior CHAPs, looking at a whole host of other issues, um, but relying on Section 28 of our statute, which is the statutory basis for the CHAP's authority and how you're to do your work. So when we put together and convene a CHAP, we follow the National Academy of Sciences selection process. We get recommendations, three times the number of CHAP members. You're vetted through an entire process, which you may or may not remember, where we've looked at everything you've ever written, looked at all kinds of financial interests, and done an assessment of your qualifications to do chronic health assessment, risk assessment, and look at chronic health hazards. So the CHAP is, um, in the scheme of peer review of our agency's conclusions, uh, the most sophisticated process we have to ensure the integrity of the scientific process. So that's the guiding principle here, is we need to make sure that if we're going to have peer review, that we maintain that same integrity. We can't have, it would absolutely have to be open, public, and transparent. The peer reviewers would have to be vetted through the same rigorous selection process. Um, we can't have it be an informal process, and I don't know if you've discussed that or I've sort of heard about that, but we can't have chapters going out privately to certain people to look at um, an informal input. That cannot be the way that works. 
we look at, each of you are writing different sections of this report, not chapters, but sections, and you're peer reviewing one another's work um, with regard to, you know, with your lens from your scientific ex expertise. That being said, if you feel strongly that there's science missing, that you need um, additional peer review, you need to make that recommendation to the commission. Um, and if you need additional scientific input now, um, there's no reason to necessarily call that peer review. We could get other um, experts to come in and present more data to you if that's necessary. And we could you know, schedule another meeting or, or that kind of thing. Um, but any peer review process would need to be open, public, and transparent with the same rigor applied to how we select the peer reviewers. So I wanted to put this in context as well. And the way this process works, you, the commission's expecting a recommendation piece from the seven chat members um, vetted by you, but that will not represent or contain findings or conclusions that represent the official position of this agency. It's just your recommendation, and it would need to have a disclaimer that that's, that's all it is. The commission would then, under the statute, go forward with a rulemaking based on those recommendations, and there would be opportunities, potentially, for peer review as well as notice and comment, which are two different things, different rigor, different um, participants. But both of those um, opportunities are presented here, even after you've written your report. So just, just putting it in context, all you're writing is a recommendation to the commission. It doesn't represent the commission's conclusions or findings in any way. It would have such a disclaimer on it. But if you need peer review, if you feel strongly, whether that's in a particular area that you feel is underrepresented, particular issues, the whole report, you need to include that as part of your report. Um, and if we need to set up a peer review process now to get the right people on that panel, that would be something we would need. It would be uh, extraordinary. I'm not really aware of a separate peer review process occurring in a prior CHAP. We've had prior CHAPS reports be public and be made um, and, you know, public comments sought on those. And that's an option for you as well, we could consider. Um, so with that, I think I'll answer any questions you have about the process. To give you a little perspective from our side, um, several of, this, of the sections of, of our report will be standard uh, review of areas that are pertinent to our report and to the recommendations that we will make. And, and, and those don't really require peer review. But in, in some sections, we're going to be breaking new ground. Uh, and in, it's in those sections, I think, that the, the panel feels fairly strongly that we would like to have some peer review, to have, as we would for a, a research article that breaks new ground that we, we're going to submit to a publication, would be peer reviewed. Uh, and, it's, and it's in that context. Um, so we're, we're and, and it's, it's these two areas that we're breaking new ground that really drive, will drive our recommendations. That's why I think we feel strongly that we need uh, to have this peer review. So, so there are a lot the other... of timing issues here in terms of an options that we can consider. We don't need to consider those right now, but it's giving me some things to think about. I mean, do you make the recommendation finalize it with the caveat that these two chapters um, should be peer reviewed? Or do we engage in that peer review now? Do we start with a schedule that um, has us running out to get those peer reviewers right now so that when those couple of sections are done, we have the people lined up to look at those 
later this year. Um, it, it just accelerates the drafting and the process in order to meet the April deadline. Um, but there are lots of different options we could pursue. You could finalize it with the recommendation that it be peer reviewed. Um, so it really depends on you know, our scientific team working with you to figure out what makes sense where you are in the process and, and how quickly we can get the National Academy of Sciences to make recommendations and that kind of thing. But it, you know, I'm sure if, the, if you recommend to the commission that these two sections are breaking ground and we would like to have additional comment or peer review, um, that's something they'll need to consider and we'll go up a level and figure that out. May I just add, uh, <clears throat> our thinking uh, about peer review was not, was not because we feel we need additional expertise. Um, it was only adopting good practice, uh, for example, also from the uh, National Research Council reports. As a general rule, peer review makes every report better. And, and our idea to adopt this here was, was really inspired by, that, by this insight. So let me stress, we don't feel we need additional expertise on this panel. Um, I feel, however, that this request or this idea is, is sort of unprecedented. That's what you're saying. So in previous CHAPs, this was not common practice. It's varied over the years, and I don't have all that history yet, but we've... Um, put it out for public comment, a report when it was final. And sometimes we've said that's for scientific peer review and public comment. But there are more recent documents that have been issued by the federal government that talk about the fact that when you just put a document out for public comment, you don't, you're not guaranteed that you get the scientific expertise to actually look at the issue. And what I hear you saying is that just like a scientific article would benefit from making sure you have that input, I'm not sure just putting it out for public comment, even if we put the words for scientific peer review and public comment, you'd really get what you want. So I want to make sure you get what you want. It's, it's also not public comment. Right. Anyway, it's just, uh, you see, um, many of us are used to the um, NRC NAS procedures where peer review is, in fact, part of the preparation of the report. So the, when, when a, a piece of work at the NAS enters peer review, it is not considered the final product. It's part of the preparation of the final product. Can you but, just describe that process a bit for me? Because I'm not as familiar as you with that process? Having been chair of one NRC committee and vice chair now of a second one, what you do is you have the deliberations of the committee are uh, basically private. There are some public sector uh, analyses that are done. It's a little bit different than here where you have open public meetings all the time. Uh, the products of a committee are not released to anyone. In fact, we're not allowed to talk about it until after the entire project's over. But there is a point where you have a draft report, and that draft report basically is one that's agreed upon by the members of the committee. Sometimes it's 100% agreement, sometimes there's some dissension in, in the committee report, and they have minority opinions that are expressed in the report. That is sent out to a series of peer reviewers. Um, in NRC reports, they take subject matter experts for some sections, and they look at integrative overall uh, uh, sec uh, uh, reviewers for, for the entire document. And then what happens is you get back the reviews, they get the comments, the comments are returned to the committee. They are reviewed by the committee, they're reviewed by the academy, and then we make changes based upon those reviews. And again, it's all internal, it's all private, because it's not a final report, it's going through the final report. Then based upon the comments in the, of the reviewers, um, uh, the, the report's revised. The reviewers are named in the front of the report, but their comments are not released. It's basically a peer review. A peer review usually means that you are 
being reviewed with a degree of an anonymity, uh, although we'll know the names most of the time of who do it because we review it because we know the style and the, the features of these individuals, but some people you may not know. All right, so in the end, the final project product is a product of the committee with a agreement um, or disagreement or uh, some logical compromise on the content of the report by all the committee members and sometimes it will be a minority report and then there's a publication. That publication will in fact be the final report which is what we're looking to provide you in any case. The critical point here is that we're not looking for a chapter or two to be reviewed. What we're looking is for is the basically the product, the integrative product of what we do because it's, it's not just a chapter here, a chapter here, it's the integration and the science with which we achieve the conclusions that we are presenting to you for recommendations. We're not ask, wouldn't be asking them to validate our recommendations, we're asking to say, did, you, did we do this right? So therefore the questions would be very specific. So it would be a charge to the peer reviewers to say, we want you to look at this. We're not, we, we're not interested in whether or not we've looked at every scientific publication that's come out and whether or not there's a gotcha in the last six months that we didn't get. That's not fair. That's not what we're about. It's basically taking the evidence, putting it together, and making a strong statement as to why we come to our conclusions. So that's what we're looking at. Uh, that's the way it would be done, I think, in this particular instance. And I think that's where we're heading in terms of our thoughts and discussion, and as said by Phil. But it's, it's, it's a process, and it's a process the Academy has. It's well established. You can get the, you know, they have a procedure and it's well in place and I think it's that you can get it from them without any question. Just like if they select members of the committee, there are procedures for selecting peer reviewers and how a peer review is conducted. And it's usually fairly rapid. You're not allowed to do this over a course of six to nine months. Their request is they, you're giving you this report, you have X number of days to do it because we have a timetable for getting our report out. So that's where I sit on this issue. What it really pr provides is another level of insur assurance, in this case for your agency, that the report that we give you, that the recommendations that we made have been fully vetted, and that you're getting the best possible um, report and recommendations. Are the peer reviewers that are selected through this process vetted for financial interests and vetted for yeah. qualifications? Absolutely. And we'll, I think in this particular instance, we'll have to define for you what the qualifications are since we're not asking somebody who's an expertise in uh, developmental toxicology. We're looking at some people who are a much broader, higher level of, of skill sets, saying be able to integrate that and look at hazard exposure and, and risk. So that's the kind of people we'd be interested in. So we can give you criteria and the Academy has a slew of individuals that we all know and uh, respect who can perform that function. So um, let me take that back and we'll give it some thought as to where and how that would fit into the timelines you've been talking about over the next day. And, or the last day, and um, we'll get back to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Mike, do you have any final comments before we adjourn? Let's see. I don't. I don't think I have any final comments. Um, I, uh, you know, as usual, I'll be writing up notes in a meeting log and you know our to-do list and that sort of thing. Um, so I'll be in touch. And I'm. I'm assuming that council will will be in touch with you, and we will yes, learn from you. Yes, and I'll relay you. whatever you whatever uh, whatever they say to the panel and you know if you have any additional thoughts on it yeah. no okay. any other comments from the committee <laughs>
Hearing none, uh, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everyone.